Welcome to our first panel. I'm very much honored to have this opportunity to moderate the first panel discussion of our panel, of our conference. And this panel is in many ways, I think, very inspiring and one of the most important ones, as we will be talking about the EU integration process as the driving force for consolidating democracy and prosperity in our countries. I'm very pleased to have a really very distinguished and high-level panel. And uh, it's not only by titles that this panel is so distinguished, but it is also very representative. Let me introduce who we have at the first panel as our speakers. First of all, of course, it is our great pleasure to have at this conference the benefit of having the uh, honorary guest of Georgia in this conference, the president of Montenegro's parliament uh, here with us, Ivan Brajovic. Uh, thank you very much for participating in this, in this panel. We have the first uh, deputy speaker of Georgian parliament, Ms. Tamar Chugoshvili. Uh, we are honored to have Mr. Andrius Kobilius, former prime minister and the current deputy chair of the European Integration Committee of uh, Seimas of uh, Lithuania, Mr. Boris Tarasiuk, our great friend and uh, colleague, uh, the deputy chair of a foreign uh, relations committee of uh, Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, our colleague, since we have also many occasions to work together as national heads of delegations of uh, Georgia and Ukraine, uh, to the uh, Euronest Parliamentary Assembly. Welcome. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Gabriela Cretu, the chair of the uh, Romanian Senate's uh, European Integration uh, Committee, European Affairs, sorry, European Affairs, <laughs> of course, obviously. And also we have a perspective of the European Parliament present with Ms. Claire Moody, the member of European Parliament, and the co-chair of uh, Georgian Friendship Group in European Parliament. Claire is also a member of EU-Georgia Parliamentary Association Committee and therefore has extensive knowledge of uh, our strives and efforts on European integration paths. So as you can all see, dear uh, guests and participants of this conference, we will have many different perspectives on, the, on what role the European integration plays in the development of countries. We have a perspective of uh, uh, a candidate state uh, presented by Montenegro. We have a perspective of uh, two nations uh, of European uh, Eastern Partnership policy that aspire to become members, Georgia and Ukraine. We have two countries represented that have successfully gone through European integration. Uh, we have Lithuania and Romania, and we have the perspective of the uh, European uh, Parliament as well. So this is what I referred to as a very distinguished uh, panel. And uh, I think uh, we have all the grounds to believe that this uh, discussion is going to be interesting. We will first give the opportunity to our speakers to talk about this process, to make the emphasis on the issues that they find particularly uh, useful and relevant from their country background and experience. And then we will, of course, have many opportunities to interact with all of you, the audience. So let me first of all give the floor to our distinguished speaker, Mr. Ivan Brajovic, uh, President of the Parliament of uh, Montenegro. And before giving you the floor, sir, I also wanted to congratulate Montenegro on very important development on NATO membership. This is a very important step in many ways, not only for Montenegro, but for countries that also aspire to become NATO members one day. It really demonstrates that this policy of open doors and this policy of expansion and of embracing other countries is alive and it gives us, Georgia, a lot of hope. So congratulations and the floor is yours. U prilici da podijelim iskustva Crne Gore u procesu evropske integracije. Zahvaljujem organizatorima konferencije na pozivu i čestitam na izvanrednoj organizaciji i gostoprinjstvu. Više puta sam bio u prilici da sa govornicima objašnjavam što za mene predstavlja Evropska unija i 
koji je interes Crne Gore da bude dio te organizacije. Uvijek ističem da Evropsku uniju doživljavam prije svega kao svoje vrsti mirovnih projekata. Ako se u obzir uzme vremenski i istorijski kontekst, kao i okolnosti u kojima je ona nastala. Dodatno, nesporno je rekao bih i činjenično utemeljeno da je Evropska unija svojim članicama i narodima tokom više od šest decenija postojanje osigurala mir, stabilnost i ekonomski prosperitet. Crna Gora je sebi kao dva najvažnija u našem razumijevanju neodvojiva vanjsko-politička cilja definisala članstvo u NATO i članstvo u Evropsku uniju. Te prioritete doživljavamo kao suštinski važne za očuvanje teritorijalnog integriteta, nezavisnosti, bezbjednosti i stvaranje optimalnih uslova za ekonomski i sveobuk ukupni društvo i razvoj. Sprovodeći zahtjevne reforme, prvi cilj smo ostvarili samo 11 godina od obnove državnosti, kada smo 5. juna ove godine postali 29. članica NATO-a. Integraciju u Evropsku uniju i NATO smatramo neodvojivim i komplementarnim procesima, zato što su bazični uslovi za prijem i osnovni principi na kojima počivaju ove dvije organizacije gotovo identični. Pripadnost njima za nas označava pripadnost evropskim civilizacijskim vrijednostima koje se kao zajednice i sami baštinjamo. Duboko vjerujem da jedna zemlja može postići dobre rezultate samo kada ima jasne ciljeve, stabilnu i dosljednu vanjsku politiku, kada je posvećena izgradnji dobrosusjedskih, ali i prijateljskih odnose sa svima. Sve je to danas Crna Gora. U posljednje vrijeme, mnogi nas vide kao lidera u procesu evropske integracije u regionu Zapadnog Balkana. Ne mislim da je ovo ocjena samo posljedica činjenice da smo najviše napredovali odnosno druge kandidate na putu do Evropske unije, već upravo to što se uproko s brojnim izazovima vrlo dosljedno krećemo putem kojim smo sami trasirali. Na tom putu Crna Gora je već dosta uradila, jako smo svjesni da je pred nama još puno posla. Konkretnije, u periodu od juna 2012. kada smo započeli pregovore, otvorili smo ukupno 28 pregovaračkih poglavlja, od kojih su tri privremeno zatvorene. Naše očekivanja su da ćemo u prvoj polovini iduće godine za vrijeme bugarskog presjedavanja otvoriti preostala poglavlja i preći u zahtjevniju fazu zatvaranja poglavlja. Proces europske integracije za nas predstavlja najbolji okvir za sprovođenje reformi, podrazumio ispunjavanje kriterijuma i standarda koji treba da obezbijede bolji kvalitet života našim građanima. To je proces koji prije svega treba da nam pomogne da osnažimo naše institucije i da unaprijedimo vladinu prava u svim segmentima. U Crnoj Gori smo uvijek, imajući na umu kvalitet reformi, prednost davali samom procesu neopterećujući se formalnim datumom ulazka u Evropsku uniju. Svjesni smo da se Evropska unija i sama suočava sa brojnim unutrašnjim izazovima. Rast populizma, migracije i brexit su samo neki od njih koji su stavili na probu ideju Ujedinjene Evrope kao i njene temeljne vrijednosti. Države članica se moraju prije svega posjetiti na razloge zbog kojih je osnovana zajednica koje pripadaju i koja im je omogućila dugi period ekonomskog prosperiteta koji bi bio nemoguć bez sveopšte solidarnosti koja je bila imanentna Europskoj uniji. Uvjeren sam da je o suštinske važnosti da se i pored svih nacionalnih turbulencija i izazova u Europskoj uniji politika proširenja zadrži visoko na agendu. To je važno koliko za Crnu Goru i ostale države kandidata Vjerujte mi toliko i za samu Uniju. Nove članice donose nove ideje, iskustva i ljudski potencijal, što je važno za vitalnost svakog saveza i za njegov kredibilitet. Ohrabljujući su nedavne poruke Junkera i Makrona, u kojima se govori o više Evrope i ukazuje na neophodnost održive perspektive proširenja za zemlje kandidata. Održivost te perspektive je važna za zemlje kandidata ne samo zbog krajnjih cilja, a to je ulazak u Evropsku uniju, već i zbog transformacijone moći samog procesa. Slobodan sam reći da se Crna Gora danas bitno razlikuje od Crne Gore od prije jedne decenije. 
upravo zahvaljujući kvalitetnim reformama koje smo sprovodili u okviru integracijalnih procesa, napravili smo u mnogim segmentima. Ojačali smo kapacitet svojih institucija i u stanju smo da na brži i efikasniji način sprovodimo napređeno zakonodavstvo koje smo usvojili i koje još uvijek usvajamo. U ekonomskom pogledu, uprkos posljedicama svjetske ekonomske krize, koja se odrazila na gotovo sve europske zemlje, u Crnoj Gori se danas živi mnogo bolje nego prije deset godina kada je potpisan sporazum o stabilizaciji i preduživanju. Prosječna plata i penzije u Crnoj Gori su tada bile duplo niže nego što su danas. Ono što je još važnije, značajno je promijenjena svijest ljudi o sistemu vrijednosti kojem Crna Gora treba da pripada. Iako sve države, pa i Crna Gora, imaju kapacitet da se konstantno minjuju i unapređuju, ne može se negirati da integracijni procesi bitno utiču na promjene društva. Važan segment procesa evropske integracije jeste komunikacija sa građanima i to ne samo u zemljama kandidatima, već i u državama šanicama. Uspjeh integracije zavisi u dobrom dijelu i od naše sposobnosti da građanima objasnimo na koji način će njihovi životi biti drugačiji i koji su benefiti članstva u Evropskoj uniji. Presudno je važno da u kontinuitetu posjećamo osjećaj pripadnosti zajedničkom sistemu vrijednosti. U tom smislu smatram da mi parlamentarci, kao direktno izabrani predstavnici građana, imamo i najveću odgovornost. Mi dajemo pečet reformama prilagođavanjem domaćeg prava Evropskom, kako bismo dugoročno postigli poštovanje najviših standarda u svim oblicima društvenog života. Jer osim što je Evropska unija plemenita ideja, istorijski projekat bez presedana, Evropska unija je i kvalitetno obrazovanje, i slobodno kretanje ljudi, i zdrava životna sredina, i bezbjedni proizvodi koje konzumiramo, i prožimanje različnih kultura, i pravedna socijalna i politika zapošljavanja. Tek kad postignemo da je stanje u bilo kojoj od ovih oblasti podjednako kvalitetno u svim zemljama Evrope, možemo govoriti o istinski jednakoj, solidarnoj i pravednoj ujedinjenoj Evropi. Zato je obaveza svih nas da u kontinuitetu radimo na reformama u našim društvima, sarađujemo na temelju solidarnosti, međusobnog uvažavanja, kako bismo u suštinskom smislu dugoročno ostvarili Evropu, ujedinjenu oko istih vrijednosti uz sve bogatstvo njenih različitosti. Hvala vam. Znači. Thank you, Mr. President. I think there will be uh, questions and uh, the uh, issues that our audience will want to explore. Uh, but uh, before opening that up, I want to pass to our next speaker, to Ms. Tamar Chugoshvili, the first uh, Deputy Chair of uh, Parliament of Georgia. And before giving her the floor, let me do a little bit of introduction that is very important to set a context, because Tamar is now in the Parliament, represents uh, a political group, but in the, uh, she has also a very extensive experience of working in the civil society. I find that particularly uh, uh, something that needs to be mentioned. She has led Georgian Young Lawyers Association for many years, and she, then uh, she also had uh, been a person that was a key in devising first national human rights strategy and action plan of Georgia being Prime Minister's advisor on human rights and gender equality issues. Uh, Tamar comes with that kind of wealth of experience from different sectors, also working on justice sector reform a lot, and I find it very, very useful that it is exactly her that is going to present Georgia's perspective on what role the European integration process plays in making our countries a better place for people. We just heard that in Montenegro, the result is that people live better lives now than 10 years ago when the process was uh, picking up or starting. We want to now see George's perspective on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tamar, for this nice introduction. <laughs> um, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure and honor um, to have the opportunity to address you today. And I would like to thank you all for um, being here today to discuss the facts of European integration and consolidation of democracy and economic development um, in, in countries 
which aspire to join the EU. In many countries, the integration process drives progressive reforms and serves as a catalyst for, complementing, uh, for implementing institutional and structure, structural reforms. We gathered here to share developments of Georgia and hear about your experience and perspective on this very important process and the significance of the commitment on the part of EU to open doors to the new members as the respective criteria are met. Georgia's aspiration to find its way to Euro-Atlantic space has guided Georgia's foreign and domestic policy ever since independence, and we have found that over the last quarter of century, the support of our friends has helped us to face the various challenges on the oftentimes bumpy roads from independence to democracy. Many of these challenges have been economic, political, or related to Georgia's security. Over the years, and with your help, we have made huge progress in our strategic relations with the EU and with NATO. Becoming the largest non-member contributor to NATO missions around the world and joining the select group of countries uh, that enjoy the benefits of an association agreement with the EU and now visa-free travel to Schengen member states. The Eastern Partnership has provided a concrete framework for the realization of this vision, not least through the association agreement and deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. After the last review of European neighborhood policy stabilization and building the state and societal resilience has been defined as core goals of the EU's external policy and its neighborhood, these goals are valid for Georgia as well. For the past several years, we have been investing into building a strong European democracy with effective domestic institutions and op open govern governance system, political pluralism, free media, and independent judici judiciary, strong rule of law and human rights protection, a functioning market economy and favorable business environment. Through an ambitious association agreement with the EU, Georgia has further solid uh, solidified its reform efforts. The government developed a, uh, a focus four-point reform program in order to improve business and entrepreneurship environment through profit tax reform according to Estonian model to reform education system focusing on labor market-oriented professional development to invest in connectivity by developing high-quality infrastructure between the regions in Georgia that would improve internal mobility and local business opportunities, but also would enhance Georgia's international transit potential as a key link between EU and Asia. The best measurement for the progress and success of Georgia on democratic end are the most credible international assessments and um, reports from the credible international organizations, according to which Georgia has advanced significantly on different criteria on doing business, fighting corruption, building rule of law, reforming judiciary. On doing business, Georgia advanced seven positions last year and is ranked highest in Europe and Central Asia, according to 2008 report. On fighting corruption, Georgia is the uh, 44th least corrupt nations out of 175 countries, according to the 2016 corruption Perception Index report by Transparency International. In 2004, we were ranked 133rd, and now we are 44th ahead of some of the EU member countries. And these reforms have significantly changed not only democratic path and progress, but the general system um, in Georgia. According to the World Justice Report Rule of Law Index of 2016, Georgia is the strongest overall rule of law performer within Eastern Europe and Central Asia, holding first place and globally 34th place among 113 states. The comprehensive process of reforming and consolidating democratic institutions is still going with further steps on judicial reform being planned. According to Economic Forum of World Ranking, uh, of the world ranking 2017 by Fraser Institute. In the impartial courts category, Georgia in 2015, compared to 2012, improved 40 positions to advance the country from 98th place to 58th. 
the effective and full implementation of the association agreement remains a top priority of our government. The benefits of the fundamental transformation are already visible in Georgia as a result of meeting all necessary benchmarks. Since 28 March, citizens of Georgia can travel freely without visa requirements to Schengen area. By introducing new norms and standards, we are investing in increased trade with the EU and Georgia's attractiveness for foreign investments, promotion of local enterprises, and generation of job opportunities. Georgian products are already present at the EU market. We have one of highest indicators in teacher and student mobility among uh, the Eastern partners. Georgia is an associated, associated partner to EU programs such as Horizon 2020 and Creative Europe, which further contributes to deepening our education and cultural links with the EU, but also raising awareness about Georgia in the EU. Important to mention that for the last couple of years in a row, tourism has boosted in Georgia. Much has been achieved, but much more yet is to be done. We follow our ambitious agenda step by step and are, taken, uh, are taking an active and full potential of our partnership with the EU. Our plans include intensified legal and, legal and institutional approximation with the European Union, enhanced cooperation with the EU specialized agencies and programs, deepening sectoral cooperation, expanding interconnections, as well as intensified cooperation in security and defense. Let me reiterate that association agreement does not constitute the final goal of our partnership, rather through comprehensive political association and economic integration, it will create a solid ground for Georgia's deeper, deeper political integration into EU in the long-term perspective. We are at a defining time for the future of European Union. Therefore, we wish our friends all the success to accomplish their vision of a united Europe so I will stop here and I will remain open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker, I would like to ask Mr. Boris Tarasiuk to be our next speaker, if it, he is not taken by surprise. And he's such an experienced diplomat, I'm sure he will not be. And the, idea, the reason I do that is because we just heard Georgia's perspective, and it would be best to hear Ukraine's perspective at the same time, you know, right, right after it. And then we will have a chance to also see the experience of countries that have gone through the process themselves. So Mr. Tarasiuk uh, is, I think, very widely known in this audience and doesn't need my presentation, definitely. But I do want to mention that he has twice been the foreign minister of his country, is a very experienced diplomat, as I have already mentioned, and is a person from whom I also uh, try to learn uh, a lot. <laughs> so thank you very much for wisdom and expertise, and I give the floor to you, Mr. Tarasiuk. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. After this uh, warm presentation, I feel myself much more encouraged. Um, honorable speakers, uh, uh, dear fellow parliamentarians, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to participate in this parliamentary conference uh, being held in a friendly uh, Georgia. For us in Ukraine, Georgia is uh, a, a good friend, was, is, and will be a good friend. And uh, needless to say that, uh, like for Georgia, for Ukraine, the European and Euro-Atlantic integration was, is, and will be our objectives. Unfortunately, on this way, we have not met yet uh, the similar uh, understanding as it used to be the case uh, with regard to our neighbors uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and in Baltic states, uh, regretfully. But I hope that um, much depends not only on the European Union political will, but uh, much depends on uh, our homework on our deliverables uh, uh, for both uh, uh, Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova. Um, and um, uh, I would like to reciprocate uh, with what uh, Tamar just said, that uh, uh, being uh, many years um, the, the partner for the parliamentary dimension between Ukraine uh, and the European Union and uh, uh, European Union and Eastern partner 
parliamentarians, uh, I must say that with the new composition of Georgian parliament, uh, Tamar uh, entered uh, with a very strong uh, European voice of Georgia in uh, Eastern Partnership and the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly in particular, where she is leading the delegation. And uh, I think that um, Georgia is in the right uh, way. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm very happy with the successes of uh, our Georgian friends are making on the way of both European and Euro-Atlantic integration. <clears throat> as soon as uh, a disciplined uh, member of parliament, I have to follow the guidelines um, uh, given uh, by our chair, uh, uh, Tamar, and uh, speaking about the impact of the European integration on the Ukrainian society, I would like to say that um, the effect, uh, the impact of the European integration was, is, and uh, I have no doubts uh, will be a, a great driving force for the Ukrainian society. Let me uh, mention to you that two revolutions um, uh, we took place in Ukraine were about uh, European integration, were about uh, European values uh, and principles. Um, and especially when it comes to the uh, revolution of dignity, or Euromaidan, as we call it, uh, uh, since November 2013, uh, well, the Ukrainian stood in favor of European integration for Ukraine as against the decision of the then leadership of the country not to sign association agreement. So this is how the uh, revolution of dignity emerged. So it was about European integration. Millions of Ukrainians were um, protesting throughout the country in order to uh, return back Ukraine to the European and Euro-Atlantic integration course. And uh, finally, it happened to be the case. But unfortunately, on this way, we lost uh, hundreds of uh, lives uh, and uh, in addition, we received Russian aggression and uh, the war which is taking place on our uh, east uh, in Donbass. So <clears throat> millions of people uh, were motivated uh, with the European uh, integration idea. So was the society satisfied with the implementation of their expectations during the Euromaidan of uh, 2013 and 2014? So the answer is uh, uh, not. Not completely, at least. <clears throat> and as soon as I am substituting the, my colleague, whom it is Im impossible to substitute, so and since uh, I represent the uh, opposition in the Ukrainian parliament, I have the liberty to speak on both successes and negatives uh, of uh, our European integration. And in this regard, before doing this, I would like to say that this year, the year 2017, happened to be one of the, the year of successes on the way of EU-Ukraine uh, relationship. So we have the association agreement entered into force. Uh, we uh, had um, uh, the uh, free trade area entered in, into force, and finally we uh, got the visa-free regime, which uh, millions of Ukrainians are enjoying um, uh, since this uh, June. So this is obviously something Ukrainian people were uh, expecting for from uh, Euromaidan, from the leaders of uh, democratic uh, opposition at that time. So now we are concentrating ourselves on the implementation of the association agree agreement and um, the comprehensive package of documents uh, uh, in, the cons uh, uh, in the context of limitation of the association agreement were approved. The key uh, document is the action plan for implementation of the association agreement which contains more than 2,000 uh, tasks and more than 5,000 concrete measures to implement uh, the association agreement. So the parliament, uh, <clears throat> on the initiative of uh, the executive power, uh, was busy, especially this year, in uh, 
passing through the legislation which um, uh, could be regarded as judicial reform, educational reform, pension reform, energy sector reform, public administration reform, uh, reform of the electoral code, uh, well, and many others. Uh, when you listen to the representatives of the Ukrainian authorities, um, the government, the president, uh, and those in the majority, you will, uh, you will hear the rosy picture of uh, the reforms process in Ukraine. So when you will listen <clears throat> to the representatives of the opposition, you will hear another picture, another story, that uh, those reforms are not reforms at all, and they are lacking a very substantial uh, content. The people are not uh, satisfied. They do not feel themselves happy with these reforms. Um, <clears throat> so where is the truth? Who is right, who is wrong? The authorities or the opposition? Uh, and it seemed to me, and I dare to say that um, uh, the, the truth, the reality is uh, somewhere between. So there are uh, reforms, but they are not uh, sufficient. Uh, the authorities are not very much consistent in making those reforms. And especially it concerns the fight corruption. So these are uh, some of the problems on the way of uh, our uh, European integration. Uh, but now the, the government and the parliament are working over the creation of the joint working group on the implementation of uh, association agreement, and this is very encouraging things. So, speaking about uh, the, uh, the challenges uh, on the way of European integration, so what are those challenges? So, uh, among those challenges, I must refer to uh, the challenge number one, the war Russia has imposed on Ukraine. So this war is consuming a lot of economic financial resources and which is more, much more, more important, the human lives. More than 10,000 Ukrainians were killed uh, by aggressor and um, uh, we have 1.8 million uh, internally displaced persons which is a heavy burden on the uh, state. Uh, also, 20% of our economy is being lost as a result of this uh, aggression. So this is one of the biggest challenges. Is it possible to make reforms under the uh, atmosphere of such aggression? So there, was, there were discussions and a lot of discussions are still going on, but um, the reality proves that it is possible to fight the aggressor and to make reforms. So, and uh, what is needed, the consistency in making those reform. So, the consistency is one of the challenge. The corruption is also one of the challenge, but uh, I think that um, uh, uh, we will overcome uh, these challenges. And um, speaking about the recent events which took place and which affect us, the aspiring nations, that is the uh, Brussels um, uh, uh, Eastern Partnership Summit, I must say that uh, we, the, uh, the countries of Eastern Partnership, might be happy with the results of this summit, but not completely. So for us in Ukraine, <clears throat> what was lacking, the recognition of a joint danger for the European Union and Eastern Partnership countries, that is Russian aggression and Russian aggressiveness. So uh, also, uh, we were lacking in hearing some of the uh, expectations uh, from the European Union, that is uh, um, the, the package of financial assistance to at least three countries, uh, Georgia, uh, Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, we are lacking the response on the, uh, we in Ukraine are lacking the response on our aspiration to join, uh, to be associate member of the Schengen um, Agreement uh, and some other uh, elements. To finish with, I would like to say that we in Ukraine have a very good and fundamental basis for moving ahead, which oblige uh, the authorities and the political elites to move ahead, because uh, if the referendum on the EU membership takes place now, 77% 70, um, uh, of Ukrainians would say uh, in favor of uh, EU membership, 
and 62% in favor of NATO membership. So this is probably not that impressive as it is in Georgia. But nevertheless, uh, this is a very good fundamental and basis for Ukrainian political elite authorities in majority and in the opposition to move ahead. Um, uh, with these words, I would like to express gratitude to the organizers of this conference and to uh, our uh, host, uh, Georgian parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tarasiuk, for this very open and uh, very interesting perspective and the discussion on the not only progress achieved but also challenges and highlighting what some of the common challenges might be that we are facing on this path. And obviously there are common challenges. We uh, uh, Georgians have very special feelings towards Ukraine and do have, uh, um, you know, full heart, you have full hearted support from Georgia when it comes to this very acute problem that Ukraine is uh, facing, along with others, along with Georgia and uh, uh, along with our other friendly nations like Moldova also. We uh, do believe that standing together, being together, makes us stronger vis-a-vis uh, -vis this force and uh, makes also our claim to the EU uh, better heard by the EU. Um, you were mentioning what we were not able to achieve during this summit, since we were more ambitious, had more expectations, maybe wanted to deliver more. But uh, obviously, the fact that this were not achieved during this summit does not mean it will not be achieved. It doesn't mean we will lose our uh, persistence. It will only make us stronger. We have platforms. We have uh, plans to work even uh, strong, even uh, better together in a more coordinated way, the three countries, and I'm sure with these coordinated efforts there will be somewhere in the end, you know, we will really get to where we want to be. Um, thank you very much. Now moving to the countries that have gone through the integration process, and it is very, very, uh, it is on purpose that we have actually Lithuania and Romania in this panel. Um, Mr. Kobilio says, uh, uh, the Prime Minister of his country, twice, uh, has a, a lot of experience in this process on how you get to where you want to be, because you have been in this political process engaged from the very start, when this process started in Lithuania, and therefore we believe you have a lot to share with us on what are the challenges, what were challenges then, what could be some of the commonalities that you see between Lithuania in those days and Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, and other countries these days, um, so, the floor is yours. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Tamar. Dear colleagues, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, really it's a uh, pleasure and honor to be part of that conference, and thanks a lot for, for you know, organizing this conference and, and bringing all of us together. And it's really very good to have a uh, conference of parliamentarians, because from my own experience among uh, colleagues, we can speak much more sincerely, much more openly than sometimes, you know, bureaucrats or even diplomats are, are doing. So, thanks a lot. Really, Eastern Partnership Policy, from my point of view, is uh, one of the most important policies of EU. And it helps Eastern Partnership countries to reform themselves, but it's important not only for Eastern Partnership countries, it's important for all Europe because it brings stability and prosperity to the region, which is close to Russia. I will not elaborate why it's so important to have successful countries around, you know, to have some kind of belt close to Russia, but it's really, from a geopolitical point of view, it's one of the most important things which we need to do together. So it's good that Europe is starting to understand that it's better to export stability into the neighboring regions than to import instability. And it's good that the EU is bringing uh, stability into Western Balkans. For the time being, speeding up negotiations on membership. And the question for us is very simple. Why not to do the same with Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine? So that's a question which we're trying to put quite often in, in, in big corridors of Berlin or Brussels or, or Washington, D.C. So really, EU has enormous soft power that's our experience. Soft power to assist reforms 
in neighboring countries through offering a perspective of membership in the EU and demanding reforms. Carrot and stick, that is how reforms were done in Lithuania in the 90s. And carrot for reforms was, of course, membership perspective. And uh, that is how we were doing not only economical reforms, but also reforms in strengthening democracy and strengthening the rule of law. During that period of time, as Tamar mentioned, I was two times Prime Minister of Lithuania, and I am still not in prison. I was not very happy with the outcome of recent Eastern Partnership Summit. Like Boris told, there were good results, but uh, I, would, I would say ambitions on EU side should be bigger ones. Why I am not so, so happy with the outcome? Because it did not give a clear new incentive new carrot to keep motivation for reforms in Georgia, Moldova, or Ukraine. From another side, it's clear that Georgia, in particular, and Ukraine, I understand Boris' criticism towards uh, some, some, some developments in, in Ukraine, but you know, both Georgia and Ukraine achieved quite a lot during recent years. And we can praise, really, uh, you know, both the government and Parliament in Georgia today for really doing a lot. Of course, from another side, still much more needs to be done, especially in fundamentals, like real transparent and democracy and rule of law on international standards. The most important thing, it's my advice, from my own experience, the most important thing when you have constitutional majority in the Parliament is to learn how to use such a political power for implementation of reforms and how not to give up to temptation to use your majority in order to diminish some rights of opposition, to diminish freedom of speech or rule of law. We went through the same. In 1996, we had full majority in the parliament and temptation to use that majority, not always for, for reforms, was really a very, very big one. On what kind of reforms Georgia needs to concentrate? Of course, it's obvious association agreement and free trade agreement as a basis for future reforms. Implementation of those agreements will bring a lot of benefits for Georgia and especially for its economy. Again, our own experience. When we got association agreement, we had a lot of uh, you know, uh, people who were speaking that we should be very much afraid of some of the reforms. And now when we're looking back, you know, who benefited mostly from all those reforms? Exactly the people, especially from the agrarian sector, who were you know, most loudly you know, expressing their worries about what, what those reforms will bring. But what I would like to tell and to say that the easy part of reforms is over. Why? Because before you were coming to the agreement of association agreement and uh, uh, with a free agreement, you know, you made a lot of very bold steps, you know, bold, bold, bold reforms. But you had very clear carrots and sticks for reform agenda. You knew what you need to do in order to get very tangible results, and you, and you knew what you will get from EU. That was really a very clear, practical mechanism how things were going on. Now there is no clear new big carrot in the forthcoming future, and you need to do some painful reforms. As we know, all of us, you know, there is no clear membership perspective for time being. We hope that it will come, but nobody knows when. It will take five or ten years. So uh, there is no clear membership perspective, like a carrot, and there is plenty of sensitive and painful reforms. That is why you need to have enough of uh, political will inside of your political community. And my advice would be to evaluate your job, the job of your government, not by its popularity in opinion polls or ability to win elections, but only by its ability to push forward what we can call European type of reforms. So I would share some, some of our initiatives which we you know, we're trying to do, and we're trying to do, you know, just in order to assist you 
in order to assist both EU to push forward, you know, reforms in, in all Eastern Partnership countries. I don't know if you know, but in Ukraine we have quite a lot of discussions about one of the initiatives which we proposed. We proposed for Europe to create a new big carrot for Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, uh, which we can uh, name in a very simple way. Conditional on reforms, European investment plan for Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, with annual investment into Ukraine real economy out of 5 billion euros and proportionally a little bit small amounts into, into, into Georgia and Moldova because of your size. We are happy that the European Parliament recently, when they were debating special resolution on, on recommendations to a system partnership summit, they supported those ideas. Uh, we are pushing forward uh, on a political and technical level in order to have these ideas becoming reality because we see that really it can become this new some kind of carrot in between of uh, you know where you are today until you will get uh, membership perspective from my understanding georgia really can become a star performer in implementation of european reforms <coughs> simply because you have constitutional majority which is in favor of integration and you have opposition which is also in favor that's very lucky you know, <laughs> uh, architecture combination, which is not the case you know, in, 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 in other countries of Eastern Partnership country, uh, region, and it, which was not the case even when we were going through. Luckily, we had no, no big uh, opposition towards our integration, but nevertheless, you know, you have very good, good combination. So my advice would be very simple. You need to benchmark your success in uh, pushing forward European type reforms and in your integration closer towards uh, EU, uh, you should, you should uh, benchmark yourself against countries of Western Balkans, not only against members in Eastern Partnership region. And I am absolutely sure that Georgia can show that you are in some cases even maybe better prepared for integration into EU than some countries of Western Balkans. Maybe Montenegro is much better <laughs> to compare, if to compare, but Georgia can be number two. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my, 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 and Ukraine, well, I, I can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that is why, really, the final. That is why, at least from my point of view, you need to ask, and all of us, we need to ask EU to have more individualized approach uh, towards Eastern Partnership countries and uh, new carrots for reforms, like investment packages, not just statements about recognition of your aspirations for the membership in you. Those statements are nice. You are spending a lot of time to, to achieve those statements, but they do not give any new added value to the whole process. 20 deliverables till 2020, from my point of view, is not a very big and nice new carrot. So we need to see for something more. So, and uh, help us to convince our friends in you about the need of new big, tangible, and visible carrot for reforms for your countries, and help us to convince you that Georgia can be a real star performer in implementation of European-type reforms. And membership then will come. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Kodilius. Thank you for this inspirational uh, remarks uh, and uh, for this ambition that you have put in this because we are often told that we are most ambitious. I mean, I am often uh, told that I sometimes want too, ma too many things, but I think what we have heard from you is uh, uh, equals to that level and I very much, it very much corresponds to our aspirations. Yes, we need to speak about what we want to get. And yes, it is very difficult to go through very difficult and painful reforms when there is no new carrot. You are very right in pointing out that one of the successful achievements of our countries, of many of the countries that are here, is the visa liberalization, which has taken a lot of reforms on our part. But it was still achievable, doable, manageable, because we knew what we were getting at the end, you know, at the end of the process. And that helped move in that right direction. I mean, we are often also reminded when we say that, that we do the research ourselves, and we know that very much. 
modernize our countries. We want to make lives in our countries better. And that's why we do all these reforms, not to look nicer to the others, but we do it because we want it for ourselves. But still, nevertheless, the process is so difficult that this kind of carrots are very necessary. So thank you very much to you personally for being an initiator and for pushing this uh, with us together. Um, and uh, I really do hope that with more people like you uh, and more supporters like you, uh, we stand a better chance together to get where we want uh, to be. So thank you very much. Now I pass the floor to Ms. Gabriela Gretu, our uh, speaker from Romania. It is uh, also very interesting to see and hear how the perspective in Romania has changed, how the people's attitude have changed uh, um, before the membership, after membership, what was considered as most challenging, what are the moods towards the European Union now. So the floor is yours. Dear colleagues and friends, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank our Georgian friends for inviting me here to share with you our experience as a representative of a still new member state of the European Union. However, 11 years uh, have already passed since uh, Romania joined uh, the Union. We have already got some experience without forgetting yet uh, the pre-accession period and its feelings. Uh, as uh, you have been made aware by now in our many bilateral meetings, uh, my country is very much interested in developing our relations uh, as almost neighbors we are, <laughs> and it supports, it supports uh, your aspirations. I personally believe that uh, Black Sea could unite and not separate us. But I'll not speak in a compulsory way in my capacity uh, of the chairperson of European Affairs Committee expressing some official, non-existing actually, common views about our European experience. Allow me to use more my academic background uh, without being too didactic, <laughs> I hope and my last 13 years of working almost exclusively on European affairs as a member of the European Parliament and uh, the National Parliament. Uh, allow me to be more friendly, less formal, uh, but honest and clear. And I like to challenge you a bit in order to have a good debate uh, after all my co-panelists would finish to address the conference. I shall start by stressing uh, that our conference today, it's not about, about your or us belonging to Europe, Europe. Europe is a large continent with a long history, including two bloody wars in the last century. We don't want to repeat. Uh, nobody wants to we hope. Uh, we are speaking about the Union, European Union, an entity which has succeeded in providing its citizens with seven decades of peace. It is the most important, uh, uh, important achievement uh, and we don't have to forget this. I am a kind of old-fashioned left-wing European federalist. And unfortunately, I cannot prevent myself to notice that a rumor has been spreading throughout Europe, saying that the Union has done its duty and the Union could die. I don't agree with. That means I do believe that the United States of Europe is the final goal of our policies. When will be achieved? Nobody knows. Uh, it could be in seven years or in 50 years. It depends more on our political will and courage than in some objective conditions. The Union needs some founding mothers, Tamara, pay attention. <laughs> because the first Union has had only founding fathers. Uh, 
But pay attention, dear friends, all of you, European Federation, Federation has to be a good society to live for every citizen, not just for a few. So, uh, I made such a long introductory remarks for a reason. To tell you that not every critical thinking about the Union is Euroscepticism or anti-Western propaganda. It could be only the honest attempt of making a good diagnosis of reality in order to fix what has been wrong and to develop the good parts of the project in order to keep our union united, uh, as strange as it sounds for you. European Union has been, for the latest decades, the most peaceful, wealthy, democratic, and even happiest, if you wish, society among existing societies on the earth. Society, not organization, it's a difference. It has been the most, the most equitable also, in spite of its increasing inequalities, if comparing with other developed regions which lack what we call welfare state. Within this society, citizens enjoy the four freedoms and share some common values, or they would have to. But union, it's not perfect at all, and not completed yet. The most integrated level, as you know, of the Union is a single market, but it lacks a single market of labor. We have only the first step, free movement of labor, but we don't have yet an envisageable, at least, a European social system with a common price that, that means a European salary. This situation allows a kind of one direction movement, mobility of labor from east to west, from poorer countries to richer countries, and sometimes only uh, a mobility of the capital on the opposite side, with a strong brain drain uh, and feeling some discontent among us. Uh, at least for member states not able to deal with the risks. Experience one, the Union could be taken as a model, as a reference, never as the solution for domestic problem. It is not the solution. On the contrary, for short and medium term, creates complications when promoting some policies. For short and medium term, the Union doesn't want itself more complications than it has today, with Eurosystem problems, inequalities and social unrest, and rising of populism and now sovereignism. The report of European Parliament and the conclusions of the European summit could be taken as very positive for Georgia in the current conditions and uh, being the changes of the new European neighborhood policy. Not to be frustrated, please. Uh, keep your hope and your optimist, because for many, the Union uh, started in losing its charm. With reason and without reason, many times without reason, only because the Union has been taken as a kind of scapegoat for all bad things which happens in one or another member state. But other things went really wrong or are still missing, starting with a genuine single currency, some neoliberal policies, failing inequality within society and uh, between societies, with more recently uh, an imbalanced distribution of power and responsibilities between European level and uh, national level. A long-term process of reforms 
concerning policies, functioning, and institutions has started in Europe, in the Union, at least the debate on them. And important changes would follow. Experience two, Union, it is a moving horizon, not a target, a defined goal uh, you have to achieve. One, have to start now to prepare for the European Union of uh, 2030 where, where, or 2050, including, for the future. Uh, never economic integration before without political integration. Once, Joseph Stiglitz said, and I support his assessment, but with an exception. Very similar countries, uh, equalitarian domestically, and with their own social uh, market economy, could join easy the European Union without uh, too strong difficulties. Sadly, I have to say that for you, Georgia, Slovenia is the most appropriate model of action than Romania in spite of our many similarities. We are most, more or less very similar, but our way of acting during the last decade, I don't know if it is the most appropriate for the future at least. Experience three, a successful integration needs avoiding setting up as an objective a welfare state society a social market economy, but replicating inside a third country neoliberal model that means based on cheap labor, foreign investments, and exports. Nobody told us 20 years ago this. And uh, that model we have adopted, it didn't work so well. We started with absolute good faith, uh, quite uh, vague general knowledge about what is happening, excessive hopes, and a kind of blind obedience concerning economic neoliberal policies. Uh, the citizens' welfare has been secondary, and as a consequence, their support, unfortunately, is lower than before. Because we have to understand, I'm a federalist, but European Union, it is not a federation yet to take responsibility for the citizens. It could be understood as a kind of quasi-federation, but the federal level is still too weak or imbalanced. We have three kinds of instruments of intervention. Regulatory acts, uh, either an ever-growing <laughs> financial instruments, the budget, and coordination between member states. But regulation are limited by, by the treaties and the principle of subsidiarity. Budget has been an important, but uh, actually only a small part of gross national product, more or less 1%. That means too little for producing uh, sensible changes. Coordination is even more difficult because of having a single market, stronger and stronger, but 28, 27 member states and uh, political decision makers in our capitals fighting each other. So, nobody would be smart enough or such a liar to explain uh, that through sacrifice of citizens, we could be happy. Because it was a question in your question. The people used to live today, and the generation who has faced all difficulties of transition cannot be fooled, uh, you know, uh, again, without facing the risk of losing uh, their sport. Experience four. In the same time, with European convergence, we have to pay very much attention on domestic convergence. 
between regions, urban and rural areas, and between citizens, not to have uh, too high inequality. For us, uh, accession worked very well as a good motivation to, to push for, uh, to, to, to make good changes, especially democratic ones, as my friends uh, told already. But experience five, external motivation has to complement internal ones. Nothing more dangerous than taking an a somehow exterior uh, reason to be accepted in the club uh, as a unique reason for all your decisions. If failing and achieving, uh, in achieving the goals, in due time at least, both decision makers and European Union would be taken as an escape goat and uh, the necessary trust for public institutions uh, for their good working, you know, would disappear. Reform have to be made, always taking into account citizens, country development, and its social, economic, and democratic pro progress, if we could say so. Experience six, economic growth, it's not the same with progress. Pay attention. Founding fathers uh, thought European Union as a road. Member states would work together step by step, doing common projects, setting up communities. After 60 years since the Treaty of Rome, uh, the Union it is quite a different entity with a high level of integration. It is, if you can imagine, a building site. It's a building, a complex one, uh, not yet completed and needing a project, assumed by every member state and every citizen. For this project, uh, increasing human and administrative capacity is fundamental. Not pretending doing so, increasing them. High educated people will be, will be able to adapt to the new European digital economy and to an ever-changing society. Everything, uh, the last experience, could be and has to be negotiated, not taken for granted. Unity has to be built with us as a brick fitting in the wall, not somebody outside claiming its difference and saying that the wall is wrong placed. As now, unfortunately, some of member states, union member states, used to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Preto, for presenting Romanian perspective and your perspective, I suppose, also on this very challenging process. It is indeed very important to pay attention to these nuances and to see that this integration process indeed is something of which citizens benefit. And there are a lot of issues to take into consideration when you go down that, that road. And thank you very much for highlighting those. You mentioned some of the very important things. You said that union is not perfect. It is not perfect. It is still the best thing that is there. And we, it is still something that inspires many and that many want to move closer to, and it is very, very timely that at this time we present our next speaker, Ms. Claire Moody, who comes from United Kingdom and uh, is the member of the European uh, Parliament. Uh, of course, I mean, Claire, we want you to speak about the transformative power of the EU on our part of the world, but we cannot leave the subject of uh, Brexit also without <laughs> mentioning. I know how you feel about it. But it is important, I think, to also see how come there is, we are talking about this magnetic, attractive, uh, you know, power of the EU. And at the same time, we see that there is some dismantling happening. Uh, what should be our take on, on this issue, please? 
<laughs> Thank you, Simon. And uh, I could probably take the next two days to talk to you about Brexit and uh, the causes and the consequences of it, but uh, I might perhaps stick to the point just for the moment. Um, and thank you as well for the invitation to come and be here, you know, back in Tbilisi, but uh, talking about the relationship between the EU and uh, Georgia and the partner countries. And also for being on this panel, because I think this is perhaps that follow through in you know, that relationship, which is this, making the direct connection between the prosperity and democracy and that relationship. Uh, and that that actually is simply about the relationship with the citizens. It's about delivering for the citizens. So when we go into the detail around all of the uh, you know, sort of requirements that come along or the, uh, what the EU has asked of partner countries, and, uh, and I'm very well aware that a, a lot of those asks do come and they are, they are difficult. I'm very well aware of that. But actually, they come as a consequence of lessons learned. And they do cover the economic sphere, very much so, the democratic sphere, uh, and also the rule of law that kind of sits aside the democratic sphere as well. Uh, but there is, and indeed you refer to this, there's the, the social pillar as well, which is about the, uh, the rights of citizens and the support for citizens in the workplace and in society more, uh, more generally as well. But it, it is as the, the point that I made in terms of that um, recognition of, you know, Sometimes, you know, we, the European Union didn't appear out of nowhere. It evolved. It evolved, actually, from ideas that have been evolving for millennia, spectacularly so for centuries in terms of post-enlightenment, but also, and very particularly, again, you know, repeating points that have been made, but it also grew out of bloody centuries of warfare and conflict that uh, we have now, you know, I hope, moved away from in the European Union. And what we want very much is for that, the values and the principles that we're applying are ones that then applied in our partner countries can help with the, you know, as part of our work with you around the conflicts that you are also facing. But the, the lessons learnt, the detail in those, those policies, in those uh, requirements that come from the EU, they are detailed, but that's because if you are looking at creating a much bigger, if you are looking at creating a piece of art, if you're looking at creating uh, a fine work, then it involves detailed brushstrokes. And that is, you know, those, those lessons learned are the, what are implied in those detailed brushstrokes. And I would agree we don't always get it right. I would agree that we don't always necessarily look in the right directions. But it is important that it is uh, about creating an environment that delivers, and it is an environment that delivers for the citizens, and I know, I know Tamar, that you've talked about this before, and you're very conscious of that, and uh, indeed the Georgian government has worked on that. It is also important to reflect that this is a living partnership. So I said the European Union didn't, isn't sort of the, the thing that emerged perfectly formed, it has evolved, it has grown. It is the same with the relationship. It's the same with the support that comes between the EU and the partner countries. Uh, it's a living partnership. We've talked as well, and again, it's been mentioned that uh, the European Parliament recently did a report on this relationship, and uh, it emphasized that uh, whilst much has been done, there is much left to do on our side as well as within the partner countries. And indeed, with the Eastern, with the Eastern Partner Summit that happened in Brussels very recently as well, 
the 20 goals for 2020. Again, it was about reinvigorating the, uh, the, the, the the asks, if you like, reinvigorating the goals for uh, the relationship. And I was pleased to see that uh, significantly a uh, part of that was also a gender perspective, because this isn't just about you know, one part of our society benefiting, this is around ensuring that uh, the 51% of the population is included with the other 49% in that evolution. <laughs> And also that there is, uh, you know, the, the engagement of women is a measure of health and society. But I will come back to your question to me because one of the things that, is, that Georgia does very, very well in terms of the delivery of uh, the outcomes is communication. And you recognize that it's at the heart of what you do is that you communicate why you are implementing policies and what the outcomes of those are supposed to be. And that communication is part of the process that is necessary to build the trust with your citizens as well. And that the trust in the outcome of uh, your work and I would perhaps suggest that whilst the EU is not perfect, uh, yet my country is proving particularly imperfect at the moment, I would say, <laughs> in relation to uh, our relationship to the European Union. And that is something that has developed over time. And it is because we haven't done that communication we haven't talked about the benefits and we haven't actually talked about the fundamental values enough. And it, um, it is a significant lesson to me and to my country, I think, in the way that you have delivered that, uh, that part of the work you're doing with your, uh, your EU integration. I'm also conscious that I'm here because I actually want to listen and to learn as well as to talk. So I will conclude my remarks simply by saying that you know, the point of what you are doing, the point of these reforms, the point of this dynamism is the title of this bit. It is about delivering democracy and prosperity for your citizens. And uh, I look forward to us continuing to work together to achieve that. microphone is working yes thank you very much Claire for these remarks for your insight for your work at the European Parliament and I take the occasion to once again mention these recommendations that you referred to in the run-up to Eastern Partnership Summit for us as it was mentioned here also by Mr. Tarasiuk it was very important that we did get these key messages what we want to have eventually as EU official position in the Parliament's recommendations to the Council. That is very important. That is one brick. That is one step because uh, uh, we understand not everything can be achieved, uh, uh, you know, at once. But having those statements supported in the European Parliament in such a representative body is already a big achievement for all of us, for all Eastern Partnership countries. And I thank you for, for, for that very much. Uh, uh, this concludes the first round of interventions by our speakers and uh, uh, although I have questions I will not uh, ask the questions because I do want to give the opportunity to our audience. So I open up the floor for any questions that might be in the audience. Please just signal and we will make sure that you have uh, yeah, this money. Candilian. Help is coming. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to 
address questions to our panelists. Uh, I have a lot of them, but I, I will trust try to pick up some. Uh, my uh, first question goes to Gabriela, uh, who has vision going uh, beyond European Union, like you said, United States of Europe or something. So my question here is that how you see what keeps uh, Europe connected after Brexit and after all those challenges that exist currently in Europe. So why you think that uh, it has a chance to evolve more gathering into like states or something that you have in your vision. Uh, my second question goes to Claire. Um, I want to understand uh, for my Europe, um, Georgian colleagues, uh, what are those um, specific uh, and measurable targets that Georgia or other associated countries should achieve uh, to claim for membership in uh, Europe, European Union, like uh, I see that they're eager to do so and this is uh, their ambition and they do not hide it. Uh, they are very clear on that. So what are those measurable targets that will bring them to European Union membership? And um, my third question, if I may, goes to Mr. Tarasuk. Um, we all know and we're well, very well aware of uh, Euromaidan that you have mentioned. Uh, actually, here I, I understand that uh, Ukrainian society was aware of what, is, what they are going to gain if you are associated and this uh, Euromaidan happened because they were aware or they were looking for that. But when it didn't happen, all those uh, events happened in Ukraine. How you explain uh, uh, how people were communicated, society was aware of what they are losing if they are not associated so that they could stood up for that and uh, fight for, for being associated member or then maybe uh, EU member. Um, thank you very much if you may answer my questions. Thank you very much, Mane, for these questions. Uh, Mane Tandilian is uh, our guest from Armenia, uh, and um, I would ask all the speakers, I forgot to mention it in the beginning, to, uh, to also, you know, stay, uh, uh, you know, introduce themselves uh, when asking a question, that would be very helpful. If there are more questions in the audience, uh, unless there are more questions, okay, we, will, we can start uh, responding to the questions. I think the first one went to Gabriela Gray. So, I do believe that uh, the future shaping of the Union depends on our ability of, forgive me, taking Brexit as an opportunity to increase our ness that many of our rights are actually European citizens' rights, not a kind of human being rights. Uh, mobility is a right of working, uh, education, uh, many, including political rights, to vote on local election, on regional election, on European elections, everywhere in the Union. These kind of rights are directly related uh, with uh, the status of being a European citizen, including uh, paying roaming, because I paid for yesterday 50 euros. I don't know why. <laughs> in your country, not being member of union. Secondly, to increase awareness about uh, the, important, the importance of peace. And uh, I think of uh, the tricky issue of uh, solving uh, Irish-UK uh, border and to keep, in the same time, uh, the rights of citizens, and mobility and everything, and peace there. And it is quite difficult to, to find such an imaginative <laughs> solution. Um, and I do believe that by now, in the last decade, it was a balance of uh, right wing, left wing, at the European level, uh, the Brexit changed. And we could benefit for building the social pillar uh, because we could build a different majority. Say, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't want, I, I, I have already told uh, 
my friend here that I do regret very much uh, UK leaving uh, European Union. But if they decided, by now. Uh, this, we, we have to uh, take the opportunity and uh, changing something. Thank you very much. So, Claire, the question was, what should the countries do? Are there measurable benchmarks that we have to achieve in order to get closer to our final goal of becoming the member of European Union? I think it's uh, just carry on from the previous comments as well, if, if, you don't, if you'll forgive me. Uh, but um, yes, I think actually one of the things that uh, Brexit has done so far has had a sort of unifying effect as well amongst the other 27 member states to, uh, and to remember the, the benefits of European Union membership. And uh, I would also say that whilst, you know, Brexit is a process that is ongoing. It, it isn't a process that's over yet, and some of us still harbour aspirations for uh, that decision to be reversed. But uh, as I say, we're not necessarily on the winning side at the moment. Um, in terms of the benchmarks, um, I think, in effect, actually, also, Tammy, you touched on this earlier on as well, that uh, the... the yeah, the, the, where there were clear lines and goals to be achieved in terms of visa liberalisation, the uh, the sort of EU accession is much more of a moving goal, and that's because of the dynamics inside the EU, as much as it is to do with achievements beyond there. So I I can't go to you now that if Georgia does A, B, C, D, then automatically accession membership, EU membership will follow on from that. What I can say is that you know, there, you know, there are dynamic forces inside the EU that recognize there's uh, a future that includes more countries than are currently involved. They're uh, clearly countries that are closer, associated, you know, sort of closer to that membership point at this stage. But you know, the, I would not dream of pretending to you that there is this simple formulaic solution to, uh, to that precisely because of the points I made about the internal European situation as well as the, the developments beyond is much more, much, I mean, very complex and, uh, uh, and there is much more to be done than what you can list in, on, you know, on one hand as A, B, C and D or what one country has to do. But uh, some more clarity, I think, is what uh, uh, our colleague uh, also is asking would be very helpful. Not, uh, also, political perspective sometimes uh, plays an important role because in the end, European integration is not a technical process. It is a technical process, but it is also a very political process. So uh, I think we have to uh, pay attention to the fact that it is the both and you cannot really take only one part of it and say that. But nevertheless, uh, as we say, we have to do our homework, which is very extensive, and in the meantime, wait for uh, the time when uh, it becomes better for this decision to be taken on the other side. So thank you very much. And the third question went to Mr. Darasiuk, so I will give him the floor for now. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, nobody have uh, abolished uh, uh, the existing Copenhagen criteria for uh, EU membership. So they are crystal clear. Uh, democracy, human rights, uh, rule of law, uh, prosperity, uh, well, uh, good governance. Um, so have we in Ukraine achieved these objectives? Not yet. Um, are we uh, moving in this direction? Yes, we are moving in this direction. So, uh, as to the association agreement, association agreement is not equal to the status of associated members. There is no such a, a status as associated member. So, this is just uh, the objective which is set forth. Uh, the major um, 
purpose of which is to establish the political association and economic integration. So have we reached this stage? Yes, we have reached this stage. Um, so, but it does not, um, moving that much, uh, Ukrainian people. Ukrainian people are thinking not about the status Ukraine has with the European Union. They are being, um, you know, preoccupied with their day-to-day -day life. So has the day-to-day -day life uh, become better or not? No, it has not become better. Does it depend on the European Union? No, it doesn't depend on the European Union. It depends on the uh, deliverables of Ukrainian authorities. So that means that we should not blame uh, everything and all difficulties uh, on the European Union, lack of political will to integrate us. We have to uh, ask ourselves, what have we done in order to achieve the objectives? And we should not achieve the objectives to please somebody in, the, in Brussels. So we have to achieve objectives to please our citizen. So this is our major objective. And unfortunately, um, so we have a lot uh, to do. So how people are reacting on uh, uh, our EU uh, well track? Uh, differently, uh, but uh, if one uh, analyzes the public opinion polls uh, in Ukraine since uh, the beginning of uh, uh, Russian aggression and uh, uh, until today, so one may clearly see the, uh, the tendency that the population is uh, uh, awareness of the European Union and the necessity of European integration is growing. So that is positive. So the population has received very positively the uh, non-visa regime with the European Union. So this was obviously, um, you know, something the, the, the people uh, were waiting for. Um, but uh, their life uh, hasn't been improved. And so uh, there is a much to do in order to improve uh, their day-to-day uh, -day life uh, and not to blame the European Union for uh, the problems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tarasiuk. And I give the floor to uh, the president of uh, uh, Montenegro uh, Parliament. Znači da pokušam nešto sasvim kratko da vam kažem, ne znam baš koliko će biti kratko, ali zemlje koje su u statusu, koje pregovaraju, to žele da nazove procesom pregovaranja. Svi mi znamo da je to mnogo izvjesnije ocijeniti kao ispunjavanje standarda, a nam ljepše zvuči da pregovaramo. Također, to je ispunjavanje kriterijuma, ali je vrlo važno i donošenje političkih odluka, kako u zemljama kandidatima, tako i u zemljama članicama Europske unije. 80. godina prošlog vijeka situacija u mojoj bivšoj državi, Socialističkoj federativnoj republici Jugoslavije, je bila mnogo bolja nego u mnogim zemljama centralne i istočne Evrope, koje su danas članice Europske unije. Nažalost, u to vrijeme smo mi donijeli pogrešne odluke, pogrešne političke odluke. I desile su nam se 90. godine, kada je ta država nestala u najtragičnijem sukobu tada u Evropi početkom 90. godina. I mi smo posle samo 10 godina došli u poziciju da mi zavidimo mnogim zemljama centralne i istočne Evrope koje su nama zavidile prije 10 godina. 90. godine su održani prvi višestranački izbori u Crnoj Gori. Nekih pola godine prije toga smo formirali partije i sjećam se da je u programu moje partije tada bilo zapisano da je Crna Gora, da se zalažemo da Crna Gora bude nezavisna, međunarodno priznata država, da bude članica NATO-a i članica Europske unije. Tada je vrlo mali broj građana Crne Gore podržavao takve ideje. To čuti je bilo vrlo, vrlo neobično tada. 27 godina je prošlo. 
16 godina od tog trenutka smo čekali da Crna Gora postane nezavisna i međunarodno priznata država, pa je 2006. godine to postao. A onda smo još 11 godina čekali da postanemo članica NATO-a, pa smo 5. juna 2017. i to postali. Sad ćemo naporom da radimo, da ja se nadam prije 25. koju god spodin Juncker pominje, postanemo članica Evropske unije. I nije mi drago što ćemo tamo zamijeniti Veliku Britaniju. Ja bih volio da smo zajedno tada u Evropskoj uniji. Ali hoću da vam kažem da je sad vrlo važno, to sam rekao u svom govoru, da i članice Evropske unije takođe imaju tu svijest da se vitalnost unije u stvari održava prijemom novih članova. I da je vrlo važno budućnost Evropske unije da bude otvorena za nove članove. I ono što nam je posebno važno je da na tom putu se vrednuje individualni doprinos svake države. Jer zaista želim da moja država bude ili pohvaljena, ili sankcionisana zbog onoga što je ona uradila sama. A ne da se na neki način tretiramo kao blok Zapadni Balkan ili kao neki drugi blokovi, Iako mislim da je nama svima sudbina u Evropskoj uniji, zato što Evropa nije ništa bolje doživjela od tog stvaranja Evropske unije, što je i garantovalo ovih više od 60 godina njeno funkcionisanje. Uh, indeed, merit-based approach and individual assessment and really looking at what states can and have delivered is what is important uh, in this process. And it is indeed uh, the strength of the European Union to be able to keep its door open. And we were also, just as you mentioned, so happy to hear in the Parliament uh, in September, Juncker's speech, when he was talking about the wind in the sails again, and you know this, it was much more optimistic than the statements we have heard before, so it gives hope that there is more to it. So, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vesel Mamedi, Deputy Chair, <laughs> Committee of European Affairs from Republic of Macedonia. I'm glad to say that because since we don't have colleagues from Greece, so I'm not provoking anybody. Uh, just a short uh, question, since we have the distinguished uh, guest, the Speaker of Parliament of Montenegro, I would use this opportunity to ask uh, one question. Uh, how did Montenegro cope and manage the opposition that you have inside your own country with regard to uh, join NATO? And is it that you are in NATO because you did your homework, as Mr. Boris Tarasiuk said, or you deserve it, or because of Russian influence uh, in Montenegro, so uh, NATO decided to speed up uh, the membership for Montenegro because we are, as Macedonia, in, in that path. So, uh, is it possible for Macedonia and other countries uh, to gain uh, being member of NATO and EU in such a speedy way because of uh, Russian influence? Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Uh, in the conversation with the President of the Parliament, Gruzije sam pomenuo, na primjer, primjer Makedonije. Vrlo interesantan primjer, jer sam negdje 2002-2003. godine kao parlamentarac bio u posjeti Makedoniji. Kad je Makedonija bila, kad je u pitanju priča o Evropskoj uniji, ispred Hrvatske, postao je kandidat prije Hrvatske tada na tom putu. I naravno, imala su određena ograničenja i situacija u Makedoniji je sad gora nego prije 15 godina kad je u pitanju priča o pristupanju Evropskoj uniji. Tako da je Evropska unija zbog toga treba da pokloni veoma veliku pažnju svim 
pojedinačnim članicama i potencijalnim članicama da u pravom trenutku stimuliše prave napore. I sad da ne komentarišem mnogo neka unutrašnja dešavanja u Makedoniji. A konkretan odgovor na vaše pitanje, ja mislim da u stvari ne želim da moja država bude u Europskoj uniji zbog bilo čega drugog nego zato što je ispunila svoje obaveze i što je zaslužila da bude. Također, ne mislim da smo mi trebali da budemo u NATO-u zbog opasnosti od Rusije, nego zato što smo ispunili kriterijume. I to je centralna pozicija sa koje moraju da polaze sve buduće članice Europske unije. Pritom, mi je jednostavno i državnu politiku kad vodite nikad ne možete da donosite samo odluke koje nemaju nikakvog rizika. Ja ću pomenuti dvije koje je Crna Gora donila u nekom periodu od svoje samostalnosti. 2008. samo dvije godine, pošto smo postali nezavisni, mi smo priznali državu Kosovo. Znali smo kakav će to revolt da izazove u Srbiji, čak su nam tada zajedno i Makedoniji nama protirani ambasadori iz Beograda. Ali smo imali pred sobom cilj sa neku precizno definisanu vanjsku politiku svoje zemlje i vodili smo se našim interesima. U poslednjih nekoliko godina se mi naravno držimo takve politike, pa smo se pridružili Europskoj uniji u sankcijama prem Rusiji. I to nije bilo jednostavno za nas. Imali smo odlične odnose sa Rusijom i značajan broj ruskih državljana ima određene nekretnine u Crnoj Gori. Oni su nama značajna turistička klijentela, ali smo smatrali da radimo pravu stvar i preuzeli smo, čini mi se, odgovoran potez. Naravno, i zbog toga je došlo, zbog zahvađenja odnosa sa Ruskom federacijom. Ali zaista mislim da je osnovno to što sam rekao u odgovoru na vaše pitanje, da uvijek morate da se vodite sobstvenim interesima i da se nadate da sva priznanja, prijem i u NATO i u Rusku uniju idu zbog toga što ste vi uradili, a ne zbog opasnosti od nečega drugog. Kako smo se izborili sa opozicijom nije bilo jednostavno, jer mnogo veće je bila podrška pristupanja u Ruskoj uniji nego u NATO, nego u NATO što se tiče Crne Gore, kao što sigurno svi već pretpostavljate da je za Crnu Goru bilo vrlo važno da što prije uđe u NATO koliko kad je u pitanju Ruska unija, ne moramo da trčimo za datumom, nego da vrijedno ostvarujemo zadatke koji su pred nama. Thank you very much both for the question and the answer that Ms. Kovilius has asked to speak. Just one opponent. I approve the of Montenegro Parliament that countries should do their job, you know, in reforming, in preparing for membership, and so on and so on. But uh, tango is danced by two. So EU needs to be ready also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would, uh, you know, we have uh, Copenhagen criteria for aspirant countries to become members, but I would uh, like to introduce, uh, I don't know, Macedonian criteria for members of EU. Okay. How they need to behave towards, you know, aspirant countries. And that is when I'm speaking about Greece behavior towards Macedonia. I don't want to, to go into all the details, you know, but when, when the you know, when, when uh, Macedonia is prohibited, you know, to move forward because of the name of the country, that's, I think it's unacceptable for you. Why I'm speaking this? Because there are new and new examples when EU member states or NATO member states are starting to threaten their neighbors in Eastern Partnership countries. Again, I'm very open. I'm speaking about, for example, Hungary. 
recent behavior towards Ukraine because of the education law. Hungary does not like Ukrainian, you know, uh, education law. And they're threatening that they will, you know, block all the, you know, attempts of Ukraine to, 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 to come closer to EU and NATO. I think that this is, again, unacceptable for members of EU, especially for the countries which just recently, you know, were fighting for their membership in EU, just in order to be, you know, stable and secure. Now they are threatening, you know, other countries. So I don't know if that's acceptable for Macedonia, if we shall introduce, you know, Macedonian criteria for, <laughs> for members of EU on their behavior, but that should be very clear, you know, and, uh, and, and, uh, and of course, you know, from what, what uh, uh, Mr. Speaker said, you know, countries need to, to prepare themselves for membership in EU. But again, what, what, uh, what uh, Johannes Rahn, Commissioner for, for Neighborhood Policy, is repeating always, mm -hmm. that's a very good quotation. If EU is not exporting, you know, stability into some of the neighboring region, then it's, it's importing instability. instability. And it's way we need to be very clear, if EU is not moving, fast enough into some of the neighboring regions. So our big neighbor from Russia is looking for that opportunity. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I see that there are <laughs> questions, more questions, but we need to stick to our times, but time and there will be more sessions and more opportunities for questions. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the panelists very much. Of course, EU is not an easy institution. It has 28 members in it, and this discussion also showed how many nuances there are and how many issues there are to consider when we talk about our individual bilateral countries' relations with the European Union. We're not talking about, in fact, one country's relation with another. We are talking about relation with a whole bunch of, you know, 28 member states, and that is what makes it even more complex and difficult. So thank you very much. I think the first panel showed that there is a lot of interest in the subject. I uh, would like once again the audience to applaud to our speakers.